right now, um, tension uh, and drama is what is going to get the clicks and the likes. And the media has calculated that if we put that at the top of our, you know, news uh, hour, uh, people are, you know, the eyeballs, so to speak, are going to go away. And that's frustrating, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. What could go right? I'm Zachary Carabell, the founder of The Progress Network, and I'm joined, as always, by Emma Varvalukas, the executive director of The Progress Network. And this is season three of our podcast. This season, we're going to mix it up a bit. The first few seasons were focused on guests, most of whom were members of The Progress Network, who were not mired in dyspeptic dystopia, but instead were focused on trying to build that future of our hopes and not the one of our fears. And we will continue in the same vein this season with guests, not all of whom will be members of the Progress Network, although they might eventually become so. But in addition, Emma and I will focus a bit more on the news of the week, much of which comes from our newsletter, What Could Go Right, the same name as the podcast, and talk a bit more specifically about things that are going on in real time, whether or not they're in real time exactly in the moment you are listening to, depends on when you are listening to this. But we'll focus a bit more on some of the news that would have escaped notice because much of that news doesn't get notice. And one of the presumptions and propositions of the Progress Network and of this podcast is that there is no good news, meaning the news industry is not about providing good news. It's about providing dramatic news and outrage and fear and concern and anxiety and hot emotions tend to dominate the news cycle as they always have. That's not really a critique about the ill motives of anyone in the news industry. It's just the human nature of what gets attention and eyeballs most quickly. So we are attempting to do more of the slow news and much of the slow news is the good news that doesn't get attention during the news cycle. And that will be particularly egregiously true as the United States heads into its midterm elections in November. We'll continue this season through that and true of other countries like Brazil, which is entering its own presidential election or China, which is about to anoint Xi Jinping. You name it, there will not be a sudden out growth, a sudden outburst, a plethora of good news. There's no real risk of that in the short term, the midterm. Maybe there's some risk of that if this sentiment continues to build in the long term. So we're going to look at some of that news of the day. We're going to look at some of the constructive stories that are going on all around us all the time, but that don't get the notice that they should, and also have compelling, hopefully dynamic conversations with people whose sensibility is about solving the problems, identifying them, but solving them and not getting mired in them. So Emma, what are we going to talk about today? Well, before we get into the uh, good and maybe also dramatic news, we're going to have a conversation later with uh, two people who are politicians and are going to talk to us about whether there really is a path forward towards bipartisanship. And that's Congressman Eric Swalwell out of California and Jeff Collier, who's a former governor of Kansas. So excited to talk to them. But before we get there, I wanted to start with bump a bum the malaria vaccine that just came out of Oxford. Trials of a new malaria vaccine developed by Oxford University show it provides up to 80% protection for two years. The scientists who created the jab say it has world-changing potential and hope it could be in use from as early as next year. Now, this is something that the world has made a lot of progress on already, just cutting down on malaria deaths. But one thing that we've not been able to accomplish is an efficacious malaria vaccine. And now we actually have two. And I'm not sure that people have heard about this. What do you think? I don't know. Tell us about the two. I mean, I had thought, you know, before we we talked about this, that malaria was a disease that was still a major tropical issue in, in large portions of the world, but that there were really effective treatments for it. So why is, uh, tell us why a vaccine, as opposed to some of the treatments that evolved over the 20th century, makes such a difference? Yeah, correct, correct. So, I mean, so many people have experience with COVID now. They know that in the COVID story, the vaccines kind of came out as the uh, the thing that saved the day and the treatments came later. So it's been backwards with malaria. Like you said, we've had uh, treatments that have been getting better and better, anti-malarial pills, insecticides, bed nets. Um, but up until now, there hasn't been any malaria vaccines at all to help, uh, you know, with the problem. So it's mostly children under five who die from malaria. It's still uh, almost half a million people who die per year. Last year, we got the first ever efficacious malaria vaccine. And uh, just 
this week or a couple of weeks ago, Oxford came out with the first vaccine that's going to be 80% effective at showing in uh, early stage trials. So this is exciting because people are saying now, like, actually, we could end malaria deaths in our lifetime. So who's going to pay? I mean, there, as we saw, one of the real challenges of COVID vaccines was that wealthy countries had the money, subsidized the vaccines, and organized really, really effective but costly distribution networks. And even though we were highly critical in the United States about how quickly and how equally among states we distributed COVID vaccines, nonetheless, we distributed a lot of COVID vaccines, much of which was subsidized. And one of the critiques of vaccine distribution globally is that, of course, the poorer parts of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you know, interior parts of Latin America, parts of Southeast Asia were the last to get access to those vaccines. Yeah. Who's going to pay? <laughs> the big question. I don't think that there is an answer yet, <laughs> but um, it's definitely a topic that's hot on everyone's minds right now, or maybe just hot on our minds because we were paying attention to these things. Right. But did you see that big sort of political expose about Bill Gates and um the vaccine distribution, the vaccine equity distribution problem you were just talking about? Yes, I did. On the one hand, there was this incredible sense of uh, optimism and isn't this amazing that what the Gates Foundation has done in, in addressing uh, diseases and cures, but there was also the pushback of has this actually effectively been distributed? You know, it's one thing to do something in a lab or have a great idea that you've germinated. It's another thing when you have to operationalize a great idea. And and look, I, I'm gonna, I keep pushing back on all these things because I think it's really important for all of us, in, even in the face of good news, to really ask the question of how's this gonna work? Right, and I think that the, the, the critique of the, well, actually let's just lay out some of the basics for people just in case, you know, they haven't been following. So there was a, a constellation, actually a small group of a small constellation of about four NGOs that stepped up to the plate with the COVID vaccines. And they're all um, funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, or they were linked to them. And they set up this thing called COVAX that made sure that amidst all of this hoarding from the rich nations like the US uh, of the COVID vaccines, that poorer nations that didn't have their own uh, manufacturing capabilities were able to get in on that and get some of these vaccine doses. And um, this political article was fairly critical on the execution of this, um, that, you know, these NGOs certainly stepped up to the plate where governments were not stepping up. But how good of a job did they really do? And it was like a who's watching them sort of thing. And what do you think of that critique? Look, I think it is important to recognize one, uh, that there's only so much the private organizations can do when it comes to national distribution of vital goods, right? Private organizations typically cannot build national infrastructure, although we've seen energy companies and mining companies in sub-Saharan Africa clearly can build, you know, the roads that they need to the place that they need to ship them, whether that's Chinese companies, American companies, European companies, but sort of national efforts to really reach people that have no profit associated with it either require massive funding from private organizations like the Gates Foundation, but even the Gates Foundation at its tens of billions of dollars is unable to solve those problems across nations, which require ongoing amounts in the hundreds of billions. So I think the critique is legitimate insofar as those private organizations should not be over-promising and under-delivering, right? They should not be acting like this is a, a problem that they should solve. And I'm not, I'm not claiming that the, the Gates Foundation ever said we're going to solve single-handedly the entire vaccine development and distribution problem. But it does bear sort of reminding that these are not one-offs, they're not susceptible to solutions from any one particular organization, and that in that respect, all good news should be juxtaposed to how do we actually make this real, right, as opposed to an idea. And, and when you get into the weeds of those realities, yeah, some, some of these things end up being a lot more complicated, uh, a lot slower, and often just don't work. So I think I don't mind the expose. I mind the sort of gotcha part of the expose. Um, yeah, I kept reading it. And I guess the short way to say what you just said much more eloquently is like, well, who else was going to do it? <laughs> right. You know, like, what would we have preferred that, you know, we just let these uh, other nations not get a hand uh, into the process at all? One might uh, say that that question was not just uh, the shorter way of saying it, but the more effective communication way. Of saying it. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, 
but it's it's interesting to talk about you know whether this stuff is effective or not um because the bill and linda gates foundation all just also just came out with um their annual report on the sustainable development goals which some of our listeners might remember we had a discussion uh with john MacArthur about that so these like big picture goals like we're talking about to eliminate poverty to have gender equality like really really big stuff and we are having and- this conversation at the beginning of uh uh, UN Sustainable Development Week in, in New York City, kind of juxtaposed Climate Week, which is juxtaposed to the UN annual meeting in New York. So whether you're listening to this proximate to that or not, it's in the air, certainly in my air right now, given that I'm sitting in New York City. So that's part of the whole buzz. And there's also been a lot of pushback against that. There's been pushback against uh, ESG, environmental social governance, mantras in investing that's come under a lot more scrutiny as it's become much more ubiquitous. You know, as long as it was a fringe thing, it had much more support from a passionate, engaged community. Now that it's more of a generalized thing, it's it's coming it's coming under some attack, some more from the right than from the left in the United States. And sustainable development goals, which have been quietly germinating and developing over the past 10 to 15 years um, and are now embedded in a lot of global aid conversations. You know, it's a big deal in the Biden administration to appoint a a global climate advisor in in John Kerry. Um, I think the pushback there is often, are these just yet another series of ever, ever ongoing conversations while all these global organizations get together and spend countless hours developing position papers and mission statements and and long range goals but nobody is actually held accountable for whether or not those goals are are being met that's what's interesting about the report right because it's like the cold hard facts it's it's the numbers of uh you know like are we making progress on these or not and uh the report was sort of like I read it. And when you look at the numbers, if you're looking across the last 30 years, like from 1990, which is when I was born, incidentally, things have definitely improved. Like we've had uh, much fewer maternal deaths, uh, a bunch of neglected tropical diseases. That prevalence has dropped by more than 70 percent. The share of the global population with access to clean water and sanitation has doubled. Um, so when you're tracking across the long term, it's like kind of impressive. But if you listen to Bill Gates talk about it, and he's done a couple of interviews about the goalkeepers report, he's like not not so enthused about the pace of the progress. Um, I think he said we'd have to increase the progress five times to reach the goals by 2030. Uh, and it's that over promising, under delivering thing that you were talking about before. Yeah, I mean, there's there's unrealistic goals like the ones that Elon Musk sets for his own companies. We're going to be on Mars by 2025. You know, no, we're not. We're not going to be on Mars by 2025. We're, we'll be lucky if we're back on the moon by 2025. <laughs> um, the question is, is setting audacious goals, right? That's a big Silicon Valley thing. Let's set audacious targets. Mm-hmm. Let's have an audacious vision of the future. Is doing that even with the awareness of that audacity will almost certainly not be met by actual deliverables by the date enunciated. Is doing that an accelerant? Is doing that a, um, does it get people fired up? Does it, does it create a sense of urgency that galvanizes a lot of people to work really hard to meet that date, right? Because a goal and a date are often coincident. I mean, if I say to you, I want to learn Chinese, but I don't say that I have a time in which I actually want to be competent, then I could just kind of be learning Chinese for the next 40 years and never really learn it. So I think there is there is utility in setting a date and saying, I'm going to do this by this point, even if you kind of know I probably won't do it by that point. And, you know, I, I, I think Gates is used to the sort of the deliverables and the metrics and that's been a big part of big philanthropy we talked about that a bit with rachel pritzker last season to have goals that are measurable and deliverable but you can also get too mired in that you know meaning you lose sight of not everything that is good is quantifiable we talk about this a lot in in the work that we're doing here that the part of the problem of changing sensibilities and changing how we view the world is not a measurable, not a deliverable, and or at least it's not susceptible to kind of quantitative uh, tools. It may be susceptible to qualitative ones, but not to quantitative ones. 
So that's my also long winded way of saying, yeah, I, I respect that things are not have not moved maybe with the accelerant or alacrity that someone like Bill Gates or someone who who wants things and thinks things should be done by now. You know, if you have if you have to do a software release by September of X year, the software better be debugged enough so that you can release <laughs> it by X time. Otherwise, the market's going to react really negatively. But, you know, big change. Um, is not always easily discernible in the chaotic messiness of the moment. So I, I, I'm not so sure that I, I have such negativity about, we're not gonna be where we wanted to be by 2030. And unless you believe that there's some existential turning point, and I'm sure we'll get to this later in the season, you know, that the Antarctic ice is gonna all melt because of sudden climate change, in which case, you know, all bets are off, then, um, it's it's more a matter of are we making progress quickly than are we making it by a certain date. And then of course there's also that little personal thing that I'm sure like Bill Gates, after so many years of devoting like time, energy, money to all of this, he's like not getting any younger. And I'm sure he wants to see some <laughs> real meaningful success before he goes away. I want, we're all gonna go. I want to know that the world is different and better by the time I die. For, yeah, it's a certain. huge legacy. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think the audacity to thing is is really important to to get that motivation going. But like you're saying, when we fall short, we can't look at that as a failure and reason not to keep going. Um, right. We're certainly trending in the right direction, maybe not in the past year or two. And that was the point of the report because of the pandemic and the Ukrainian war. But Bill Gates also makes the point that just as those crises were unknowns and we couldn't predict them with forecasting, uh, something like mRNA, which we've talked about before, are also unknowns and we can't predict them with forecasting on the good side. So we don't know. Maybe we'll get there by 2030 and Bill Gates can die happy. Uh, that would I mean, that really <laughs> is the goal, of course. Um, so let's turn now to an area that... Uh, no one has any hope it was going to get any better anytime soon, <laughs> which means maybe it will actually get a little bit better sometime soon. But political dynamics in the United States, partisan acrimony, division, hatred, uh, sense of they are the enemy and, and, and we are the people on the side of the angels has become so profoundly and deeply entrenched, certainly in American political dialogues, that it's hard to see any place for collective action and you know some of this and we'll now turn to two people who i think are more have been both deeply mired in the partisan because they've both run for office successfully um but i think also share a sense that yeah, it's actually more possible for people to continue to work collectively and together for constructive solutions to collective problems so tell us a little bit about who we're going to talk to I'm excited to be talking to uh, these two men today. So our guest uh, first is Eric Swalwell. He's a member of the U.S. House representing California's 15th congressional district, and he was elected in 2012. So he's been in office for a while now. And our second guest is Jeff Collier, MD. He's the former governor of Kansas. Uh, he was sworn in as governor in 2018. And prior to that, he was lieutenant governor from 2011 to 2018. And he was also part of the Kansas House of Representatives in 2006 and the Kansas Senate in 2008. He was a White House Fellow for International Affairs under Presidents Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. Congressman Swallow, Governor Collier, welcome to What Could Go Right. So both of you have enjoyed electoral success. Uh, governor, you've served as, well, Governor of Kansas and Lieutenant Governor in the State Senate. Congressman, you've been representing your district in Congress for, I think, this will be your ninth year going into your 10th, is presuming. And uh, you used to be the you know, youngest member of the delegation. Now you're, now you're a gray beard uh, in, in, in Congress years. Uh, and I think you know, the normal rub on American politics is that uh, Republicans and Democrats can't, won't, are completely incapable of working together and increasingly see each other as enemies. Not, not just adversaries, but actual enemies, right? Like, you're them, whoever, wherever, wherever your starting point is, you're them and them is yeah. bad and evil or, or wrong. And we're us and we're, we're good and right and on the side of angels. And I, I wish that were um, a crudely reductive statement, uh, but I think it, it does capture a lot of at least the public sentiment. I guess I want to talk to both of you because you've both been in this. 
I, I'm increasingly struck by like how much goes on, Congressman, in Congress that doesn't get reported, isn't discussed. You know, bills are passed, agricultural appropriations, uh, some regulatory stuff that just kind of goes on. You know, there's actual government. But of course, it's, you know, unless it's a Politico Pro or some local newsletter that cares about this, it never gets talked about. Um, well, why is that? I mean, there is, maybe tell me if I'm wrong, but there is actual constructive governing going on where, where people on both sides of the aisle, that noise of we hate each other is either left outside the room or is an incomplete picture. A ton. I mean, you're absolutely right. And every congressional session, which is, you know, two years, over 10,000 pieces of legislation are introduced. And almost every piece of legislation has a bipartisan uh, co-sponsor. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean they all get to the floor for a vote or make their way to the president's desk. Um, but I'll just give you an example. In the last month, I've passed uh, two pieces of legislation that President Biden signed, and both of them were bipartisan. One uh, on homicide cold cases uh, creates a uh, pathway for a victim's family to have a cold case re-examined after three years. I worked with a Republican former federal prosecutor, Mike McCall, from Texas. He's a friend. We've worked on many issues. Got passed, uh, went to the president. And, and frankly, we, we tried to get the White House to do a signing ceremony around this because we thought this is you know good for victims. It's, it's pro-law enforcement, pro-victim. And we weren't able to do that. We sent out press releases. No one really picked it up. And then last week uh, with uh, a Republican named Guy Reschenthaler from uh, Pennsylvania uh, passed and President Biden signed at the end of the week legislation that extends the uh, child sexual assault uh, statute of limitations. So if a child is sexually assaulted, you know, it extends the victim's ability, um, you know, once they become an adult uh, to go back and seek accountability. And, and again, like pro victim, uh, pro, I would say law enforcement, law and order. And you didn't see a single news story about it. That's not because we didn't try. I, I think it's just right now um, tension uh, and drama is what is going to get the clicks and the likes. And the media has calculated that if we put that at the top of our, you know, news uh, hour, uh, people are, you know, the eyeballs, so to speak, are going to go away. And that's frustrating, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. God, you know, I asked that question kind of rhetorically. I didn't expect there to be a, a legislative, I did two things in the past 10 days answer. So yeah. I mean, that, yeah. that's such a, you know, it's a QED moment. And Governor, I mean, so if you're like me, I live in New York City, I'm, I'm sort of guilty as charged, I'm sure, for all the various stereotypes. Um, you're a Kansan and, and we're deeply in state politics and certainly the way in which we ever hear about state politics um, is it's all a, a jungle of, of partisan insanity. And that's true on both sides, right? I mean, if, if you're in Kansas, it's California is a jungle of partisan insanity. If you're in, Can if you're in California or New York, it's Kansas. And then we're all astonished, you know, when Kansas uh, votes down in a referendum, uh, an abortion ban, like, oh, my God, really? There are people in Kansas who have a multi multiplicity of views. So when you were in state government, um, you know, what's your version of what Congressman Swalwell just talked about? Well, I, I agree, um, you know, you will pass hundreds of bills that, you um, you know, some uh, and the vast majority of them move the ball um, a little bit, uh, you know, overall it's and then you also have to do bigger things. You've got to pass a budget. Um, you know, you have to actually govern uh, there. And uh, sometimes that can be done in a bipartisan fashion. Um, you know, it depends a little bit on the structure of your of your legislature and your executive um, as well. And then sometimes you have to really go and fight to get a bipartisan bill. So, for example, we had uh, we had an order from uh, the Supreme Court. We've been fighting literally for 50 years, um, having um, a battle over school finance. And uh, Supreme Court made a ruling. We were able to put together, I put together a bipartisan uh, solution uh, to it. We put some more money in schools um, and started to have uh, some results attached to that. 
and we got it through. And we actually have, you know, stayed out of court now for the first time in 50 years, um, you know, not having this dry in. And so I think it's, I think you're capable of doing it, um, but it's, it's hard work. It really is. So I have a, a question as the sort of token millennial on this show, and it's kind of like a shade to- Hey, hey, this. hey, Emma, I, I yep. am a pioneer of the millennials, okay? <laughs> okay, fair enough. So we got two. <laughs> I was the Oregon, the Oregon Trail, early founder. Oh, the Oregon Trail. I was playing that in third grade. I have many, many strong memories of the Oregon Trail, so I'm glad to find another millennial with me on this show. <laughs> um and so, you know, no, no OK Boomer references. OK, <laughs> OK, Boomer. <laughs> no, <I'm joking. laughs> yep. I couldn't I couldn't pass that up. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's a shade on, on Zachary's question, which is my sort of political memory started in the George H.W. Bush era into the Obama era. That was like middle school, high school, beginning of college for me. And when you look at the political narrative now, it's like we've moved into such dysfunction um, and it's different than how it used to be. And whenever I read these things, my question is always like, well, what's the baseline functionality? Uh, is there really this like golden pass that we are in where politics wasn't really messy and uh, people weren't yelling at each other, even sometimes hitting each other, you know, on the Congress floor? So I'm wondering, you know, how do you see this? Like, ha have we really moved away from some kind of uh, baseline functionality? And if so, how much? Or are we trotting along as per usual? Emma, it's, it's a great question. And I think the governor was correct. He said, you know, at the end of the day, you have to govern. And, and to me, that means, you know, do you, you know, attack uh, and work the problems? Or are you just working for your own power? And that, that's regardless of, you know, which party is in power. And I, I think the, the issue that I think of right now um, where that highlights the premise of where we started, which is that you're seeing less and less of that like collaboration to solve big issues is probably immigration. Uh, and, and so you invoked, uh, you know, President Bush and, you know, President Bush is a Republican governor a border state governor, uh, you know, was the first, I would say, mainstream Republican who tried to solve the issue of immigration. He didn't, but President Obama came into office and in 2014, 68 uh, Republicans and Democrats passed a bipartisan immigration bill, including Lindsey Graham and Marco Rubio that put approximately 28,000 new border patrol agents on the border and also you know, created a pathway to citizenship you know, through vetting and not going to the front of the line, but going to the back and you know we never got a vote in the house and and had we gotten a vote in the house i think that would have been the you know the, a way to attack the problem uh by increasing border security but also you know bringing people out of the shadows and then fast forward to today and what you see is just um you know a border theater right that you don't see two parties anywhere close to being able to strike what we did in 2014 you see you know governors you know, flying immigrants from the border to, you know, states to, you know, quote unquote, own the libs. And we're, we're so far away from where we were in, in 2014 when we came so close. And so that's that's one issue that persists and it doesn't serve anyone that, you know, neither party is able to find a way, you know, to solve uh, that crisis. And it's, it's only going to get worse. You know, I, I think there's another aspect of, uh, of this that is rarely talked about, and that is the electoral world, the political world is profoundly different uh, than it was in 1980 and, and 2000. So for example, in um, 1980, the, if, you, if you just kind of arbitrarily split the population at the age of 50, that's, you know, you, and take out everybody that can't vote. So you have two populations of, of voters sort of 18 to 50 and 50 on up. In you know, 1980, that split was about 6337. Um, you know, so there was there was a there was a real difference between them. Today that split is 5248. And so the demography is so profoundly different now. So um, you know how those number how those numbers work and as that shift is, is happening 
we're we're all operating, you know, in that the ocean is really different than what it was 40 years ago or 30 years ago, or frankly, even in in 20 in 2000. Um, and so those I think those things have a, a huge impact uh, in where we're going. I'm wondering if you could elucidate a little bit. Since we're swimming in these different waters in this different ocean, like what does that mean in a in a practical sense of of how understand the demographics have shifted, but exactly how those numbers play with each other? Like, could you give us a little bit more? Sure. Um, well, for for starters, um, if you if you think about uh, if you think about there is an economic difference uh, between under fifty and and above fifty perspective of the world that will try to put everybody in that box. But you know, you're you're you know, on one side, you're trying to accumulate the other side, you're trying to hold on to what you have, um, is how one one demographer called it. But, you know, you, the perspectives of the world are, are changing. And what that means, though, is there's more opportunity for conflict, you know, we're in a, you're in, almost in a one for one uh, sort of situation. Whereas, you know, before, you know, there, there was definitely a different um, you know, a different population sense. And, you know, you had, you had more room, um, uh, you know, for consensus in one sense, but, uh, anyway, it's, it's an interesting, I think the demography is just so r really changes and it provides the, many more opportunities for conflict, uh, between people because we're really evenly divided in many ways. You know, it's funny, one of the uh, the knocks on American democracy before 2016 was election cycle after election cycle after election cycle, there was fewer and fewer percentages of the eligible electorate voting. And the United States was kind of notable in how indifferent a lot of the electorate had been to the political process. You know, so you had essentially Congress was decided by 25 percent of the electorate, plus, you know, even the presidency, given that barely 50 percent voted and then 2016 2020 where were periods of intense voter out and activism i think 2018 as well and it looks like 2022 will will be much the same and in fact if you looked at again the kansas referendum i mean massive numbers of people showed up mm -hmm. for a primary where that that actual referendum was um you know in many ways that kind of participatory energy is a good thing right we we, we want a healthy democracy to have an engaged electorate, not an indifferent, apathetic electorate. The question is in that Machiavelli world, you know, is it better to be feared or loved? Can you have an engaged electorate that is animated by sort of hope and positive desire for change as opposed to the way you really engage your electorate is you, you scare the hell out of people and then they show up because they're either really scared or really angry. I mean, Congressman, is that, do you think you can energize people? I, I mean, I get your point. You pass these very constructive bills, but you, not only can't you get CNN or Fox to pay attention to that, can you actually get voters to pay attention to that? No, and, and, and the, the best example is that, you know, President Biden in his first two years, you know, his agenda, you know, the, the COVID relief, the infrastructure and jobs package, the CHIPS Act, you know, to counter China, uh, the gun safety legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, serious signature legislative achievements uh, that will rival any president's legislative record in the last hundred years with the thinnest of majorities. And, you know, frankly, uh, we find ourselves, you know, going into this election, having to contrast A versus B. Like, like yes, we have done all that. We'll keep doing more of that. But by the way, don't go with these guys because it's chaos, it's violence, uh, it's incompetency, et cetera. And, and so I, I do think just American politics, you know, in a 24 hour news cycle, social media era, uh, perhaps throwing in what what uh, the governor described with, you know, the demographic um, issues, it, it kind of forces this, you know, um, and, and Joe Biden has said this and Barack Obama has said this, you know, don't judge me against the almighty, judge me against, you know, the alternative, uh, you know, they, they've kind of joked, uh, but I, I think there's a seriousness in that. And, and so, yes, we have delivered on our legislative agenda, but at the end of the day, um, we have to convince the voters, you know, the danger of giving the keys to government, you know, to the other side. I, I, I wish just having legislative achievements 
would be enough, especially ones that, you know, pull mostly like above 50% as far as what people want. But I think, you you know, the risk is if you're defined by the other side, uh, then you're, um, you, you know, you are at risk of not being able to continue your legislative journey. And Governor, from your vantage, right, you, um, you kind of narrowly lost your reelection bit to Chris Kovic, who had been, I think, legitimately seen as uh, the leading edge of, of MAGA or Trump Republicans. Um, but George H.W., we talked to him before, right? He, he campaigns in 2000 on a message of compassionate conservatism, right? He was going to be the, the kind of the, the unifying conservative. Now, whether or not that was just words that proved to be completely hollow, the fact is they were, they were campaign words that proved to be somewhat effective. Um, Could you imagine any turn today back toward that? And again, I'm not I'm not suggesting that those words were were backed up by reality. I'm just saying you don't campaign on something that that either doesn't focus group well or poll well or you think is not a, a message that people want to hear. You know, do you feel there's any indication of a of a shift in the public climate, even if the news and explicit climate is as agitated and extreme and palpably hysterical as it ever was. Well, I I think people want you to get things done. Okay. They want to believe that you under, you are listening to them and you can demonstrate actual results. Um, And, you know, in, in the current, you know, environment, I, I think that that is the priority. You know, the world is is a little different. Um, in you know, and George, you know, and W. Bush, you know, was extraordinarily, you know, a demagogue. And you know, there there was, you know, there were arguments about the legitimacy of his election and and all of that. Um, but that that was a different world he was responding to a to a different time and, and to a different outlook but i really think if people need to hear us communicate we're listening to you we're going to get the results you have that you, that you're seeking and you know we're going to make this go in the right direction and you know i i may severely disagree with the Biden administration's you know, budget proposals and, and a number of things they're, they're doing. Um, and, you know, we're, we're trying to express, you know, here, here's where we're going to go. This is why this doesn't work uh, for us. Yeah. And, and Jeff made a point that I, I've thought a lot about um, the governor made a point. I've thought a lot about, about, you know, Bush and the election and, and some of the, the demagoguing, and I, I do fear that at least, you know, for me, the, the first race I seriously thought about um, was the 2000 election. And then, of course, the subsequent elections. And so for, you know, me and Emma, like for our generation, politics has always been so existential as far as who governs the country. And, and so Democrats, myself included, guilty as charged you know, looked at, you know, the Bush presidency is, you know, the, the end of America. Like if this was to allow, it was allowed to continue, it could be, you know, the end of, you know, democracy. And it was, you know, largely because of how we felt about the Iraq war. And then, you know, President Obama comes into office. And again, it, it, the, the other side, the Tea Party, led by the Tea Party, you know, felt the same way so much that they questioned whether he was even a, a U.S. citizen and a citizen. And so you kind of had this like existential perspective that's been projected on America's leaders that in 2017, when, you know, President Trump took the oath and you've had back and forth both sides saying this is the worst thing, it's the end of democracy. When you actually had the greatest and and most serious threat to democracy, I think a lot of people who don't follow politics every day were just like, okay, well, that's what you said about Bush in the 2000s. And that's what you said about Obama during his eight years. And so I I think it is a, you know, a lesson about crying wolf, at least on like the threat to democracy, because I I think we missed the opportunity to really alarm people about what Donald Trump did, because he's in a category of his own compared, you know, to 
issues over policy that I had with George W. Bush. So going forward, give me the problem that democracy is, is still around in the next couple of presidential elections. I think it's a lesson for me as you know, an elected official you know, to you know, pump the brakes if your only disagreement with someone is over policy and you're not dealing with you know, corruption or just a, you know, a lack of a moral compass. Um, and and I, I think that largely is something that has plagued us over the last two decades. I'm so glad you you brought that up, Congressman, because that's exactly how I feel. And I think that's what I was trying to point to with the baseline functionality is that when your political consciousness starts with this existential messaging, you sort of, mm-hmm. it's really easy to lose the plot, right? Um, and I was wondering how that, how it's been for both of you, uh, you know, thinking along this, we're in a different world now, Um conversation that we've been talking about in terms of social media, because the existential messaging is the messaging that does get the likes and clicks, you know, you were talking about before, Congressman. So I'm wondering, what has that impulse been like for both of you? And and how do you, how do you work with that, you know, in, in this strange new world of social media, which we're still all adjusting to? Sure. I mean, you know, I have a, a responsibility, you know, to try and you know, my job title is representative, and so I, you know, I want to represent, uh, you know, my constituents and and communicate with them, and engage with them. And social media gives you, you know, the ability to do that. Um, but also, as I said earlier, it, it also gives you the ability to kind of, you know, define your priorities and contrast your priorities with uh, the alternative. Um, but also, there there is just you know, a, a temptation, you know, to, I think that on social media, the risk is that it can become not a better way to represent your constituents, uh, but just pro wrestling, right? Like at its worst, like, you know, it, 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 and that's what I found with a lot of my colleagues is that they will just rip me apart on social media they'll say the worst things about me on social media and then when i see them in person they're like hey swalwell how's it going buddy like great to see you we got to get together again yeah. and i'm just like what and i'll give you one example um a colleague of mine who i've written legislation with chaired a caucus with back in the winter of 2020 he sent a pretty nasty tweet about me and i called him out about it and, and his response was Buddy, he's like, I did not write that tweet. It was my staff. It's coming down. And I said, well, we can't really work together on this caucus. Like it would show, it looks so weird to people who want to join us if you're saying this, if you really think this about me. Not a problem, it's coming down. An hour later, I texted him. I said, hey, it's, it's the tweet is still up. He goes, I talked to my staff, it's coming down. And my staff like pinged me a couple hours later and they said, the tweet is still up. And so I called him again and he said to me, he goes, Look, my staff looked at the analytics on this tweet, and it's the best tweet I've ever sent. <laughs> so, like, it would just look weird to take it down. And, and I felt like you're my friend. Like, you've met my wife. We've had beers together. Like, you don't even agree with this tweet. You're telling me your staff wrote it, but because it's the best performing tweet you've ever had, like, it has to stay up. Mm-hmm. And then I just kind of realized that. That's how it works. And one other example, during the impeachment trial, that when I was an impeachment manager, I was uh, in the Senate bathroom and <laughs> washing my hands. And then Ted Cruz was at the sink right next to me and, and introduced himself and, and reached across the sink and gave me a fist bump and said, hey, I'm Ted. I don't think we've ever met. And I, I had seen him a couple nights before, like calling me out by name on, on Fox News. And as we're like drying our hands, he said, I want you to know, um, you're doing a hell of a job out there. That was a, you know, I just watched your presentation and you're doing a hell of a job. And again, I just thought like, what? Like you just said this and this and this, but I've come to realize like pro wrestling, it's really what happens in the ring and what happens backstage is not the same thing. And and for many, the ring is where you entertain and you give the quote unquote fans, constituents, what they want. But backstage, you know, we all get the joke or we understand it's not real. And, and I've seen social media push us to that. And, and that is what I fear. If the fans don't know that it's fake, then you get the worst consequences from them when they go out in the community 
and think that that's how they're supposed to act. And, and that's what I really fear um, right now, as far as social media and, and elected politics. I'm not entirely sure whether to be really heartened by that story or, or <laughs> incredibly depressed or some combination thereof. What do you, what do you make of that, Governor? Well, um, so uh, sitting, on, sitting on a different side, which is for, you know, if you're, if you're a Republican and you are trying to break into the news cycle, okay, it is, it is near impossible to do that in a positive manner. Um, you know, um, if you're, but if you're, if you're a Democrat in my state, um, you get a, you'll get a positive, you know, response uh, from things. And so, for example, you know, in Kansas, in Kansas, there isn't a concert, there isn't a single conservative newspaper. There is frankly not even a conservative columnist in my entire state. Um, that, um, and so when you're, when you look at that, you've, you've got to live in the social media world. Um, and you know, the, much of the environment and much of that news cycle from, from our perspective, um, is, you know, just, just wrong. We don't get a fair hearing. Uh, you know, many Republicans, you know, feel like, you know, all I'm going to do is be demagogued uh you know as soon as i get on there and and that's a that's a real challenge uh that you know the the media does not is not split up in you know the way the way the world is set up right. you know right now it, it is very you know it's a very different uh environment. Right, so I, I have a final question for both of you um which is surely hypothetical but interesting to think about if we're having this conversation at this point in 2025, uh, are we feeling that some of the storm has passed and the fever has broken? Or are we looking back at this moment and thinking, this was such a nice uh, caesura, <laughs> a nice moment of calm between storms? I mean, are we are we at the the tail end of a prolonged period of just ever escalating animosity or are we three years from now uh going wow this has gotten so much worse governor <laughs> yeah well, well going going back so i think the demography is still going to be pretty similar it you know this you know what's going in on one end and coming out on the other it's going to take a decade or two um you know to to do that so I, I think some of the fundamental things going on in the electorate are going to be the same. Um, and so I, I think you're going to see this sharp contrast. The, you know, the news media is going to be, you know, as it is, it's going to be pretty similar uh, to today, you know, so looking at from my perspective, the world will look uh, much of the world that we're operating in is going to be the same. Now, that being said though, is, I think I, I think we really do a disservice to our democracy when we say we are truly at, at risk, you know, right now. The system does respond. Okay. It, you know, we we have been through, you know, the violence of the of the 60s and and anti-war, you know, through look at the last, you know, 50 years uh, with this. We have we have a vibrant democracy more people are voting than ever before more people have more opportunities to express their, their needs i you know i think people are really looking for who's going to be the strongest to represent me and sometimes it may be the loudest person but it is also uh, people are they're really good at sorting out um and so i i trust the american people on this i i really think the democracy is still going to be there um we are still going to be in control of our destiny, um, but it's going to be important. We, we've got to, you know, the world world is still going to be there, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's a good thing. That tells you the resilience of the of the republic. Yeah, I, I'm an optimist, like the governor. I, I think 2025, we are still going to be a democracy. We'll be a stronger uh, democracy, but I, I, I do fear that you know we've never seen 
as great of challenges. And I'm mindful that I, I've served with John Lewis, who, just as the governor pointed out, uh, when he was in the caucus, uh, would tell us, you know, you think times are tough now, um, try doing what I did in, in the 50s and 60s. Um, but having been on the floor on January 6th and, you know, fearing that that was the end, not just for the people in the building, but, you know, for the country, and then looking at people who are on the ballot uh, this upcoming November who have said that if they win their attorney general race or, you know, their gubernatorial race or their secretary of state race, uh, that they will prosecute the people who certified the elections in their states uh, in 2020. That that does make me worry. Um, but I, I still believe uh, in this great country. And, and frankly, just to I have my own selfish interest in saying this, of course, um, but I do believe that the midterms, what happens in the next 50 days will determine, you know, the arc of the next, you know, two to, to five years. And I believe if the Democrats keep the House and the Senate and defy history, because that's not supposed to happen in the president's first midterm election, I think that finally breaks the fever on Trumpism because he will have lost the House in 18. He'll have lost the White House in 20. And when everyone said you're supposed to get it back, again, we'll have lost. And I think the through line is him. And I think that's, you know, to quote Churchill, it's not the beginning of the end, but it's the end of the beginning for Trumpism. And, and I think that's where the fever breaks to kind of point out what, what Zachary said. But if that doesn't happen, um, if they win even by one vote in the House, I, I believe, you know, we're in for another two years where Trump is the leader of the party. He's the nominee. And it's ugly as far as our ability uh, to work together. So not just for my own party's sake of you know, having the House and the Senate, for my sake of wanting to get back to many of the bipartisan relationships that I've had over the years before Donald Trump, I, I hope that that's the case. Um, well, it's certainly true in a nonpartisan way that yeah. uh, not, politics does not reward repeated loss. <laughs> and that whether that you right. win, at the end of the day, whether you win or lose is the ultimate test of whether or not the message and the positions you have have traction. Um, and that also is a good part of democracy, right? You, you you are in the constant process of a referendum on whether or not your message and your views have political legitimacy, not moral legitimacy, just political legitimacy. Right. And I, I, you know, from my vantage point, I think as long as we have that continued process, um, nothing is permanent, right? It is, it is a system where change is inbred, inbuilt, and chronic and that's disorienting and it can lead to really bad change um but it also can lead to the just weight part of change meaning you know it's bad now it could be totally different in two years totally different in two years totally different in four years uh and that's a good thing you know that's that is an inherently positive thing anyway we are at our time uh, obviously we could have this conversation endlessly i kind of hope there's more of these conversations. I mean, it's the easiest thing to frame these conversations in terms of, you know, governor, tell me why the Republicans are right. And uh, Congressman, tell me why the Republicans are wrong. And, and, and we could just like that conversation is ubiquitous and familiar. Uh, I feel some of this conversation is less so. And for the sheer sake of, of collective balance, it would be a good thing if there were more of these conversations in addition to some of the partisan ones of you're right and I'm wrong. Um, so you both are, have been inspirations to me, and I'm sure to others, given that a few people apparently have voted for both of you. And, uh, and I hope you will continue to be. So thanks so much for great. joining What Could Go Right. Yeah. Governor, Emma, Zachary, thank you. Hey, it's great seeing you guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Steve. Cool. Well, Emma, I, I love that conversation largely because it, it's not one that I hear being had a lot. Even if it's one that is actually going on a lot, it's not one that we hear a lot. And it does beg the question, which I'm going to ask you, but which both of us are therefore asking of everyone listening, is does that conversation and some of the stuff we talked about before uh, we were joined by the governor and the congressman, does that conversation prove why these conversations aren't had more? You know, there were no fireworks. It, it doesn't lend itself to <laughs> soundbite moments, even though there were some good stories told. Um, or we just, those muscles aren't used enough. And so it's unfamiliar, but just as compelling, even though it's not nearly as much in evidence. I think that it might be quieter, but I think, I hope anyway, that despite its quietness, it, it can still be compelling in the sense that 
I wonder how many Democrats listen to this actually hear from the horse's mouth a Republican rather than what someone might have said through the media and vice versa, right? How many Republicans listening to this actually listen to what Democrats are saying and not through, you know, any kind of uh, any kind of filter. So yeah. so I hope that is is quietly compelling. And even more, not just, as you said, listening, but not being ready to pounce because right? mm. everybody says something that somebody finds objectionable if you're in adversarial positions, the question is, are you kind of interested in listening? Or are you interested in point scoring or, or gotcha-ing? And clearly between social media and the rest, you know, we're all interested in the gotcha-ing and we're not really interested in the dialogue. Um, but in order for things to get done, obviously that dialogue needs to continue. But it, 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 that is a question I want to leave all of us with, which is, is that quiet? Is there room for that quiet? Is there room for that moment of stepping back? Obviously, we believe there is, but I think we all need to ask ourselves and look in the mirror and go, are we ready to make room for that? Um, do you value that? And there are a lot of people for whom the answer to that is, no, the threat is too great. I and think if Ted Cruz can offer a fist bump in the bathroom, we can. <laughs> all right, so we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to end the episode with the fist bump in the bathroom. That is going to be our, our, not? Our, our pay on to bipartisanship. Anyway, thank you all for listening to What Could Go Right. Uh, please subscribe to the weekly newsletter, also conveniently enough called What Could Go Right. And we look forward to a season of these conversations and musings about what's going on in the world, all united by, by the sensibility that we can create a future that we want to live in and not the future that we increasingly seem convinced we're going to live in. So thank you for your time and energy and ears and eyes for those of you watching this today. And thank you, Emma, for the conversation. Thank you, Zachary.